ado, ladies and gentlemen, we present to you Dr. Siti Khairia Muhammad Hanafia, please. Nine years ago, I was living in the US for my Master's of Science in Public Health. And during that time, I was living with my good friend, Sara, who was doing a PhD in biostatistics, and she was also an avid beekeeper. So our ground floor apartment in Baltimore had a little yard where she kept her hives. Now, Baltimore is famous for a few things. Crab cakes, the hawn hair, and a very high homicide rate. It's not famous for having a lot of snow. But when I was there, in the short time I was there, we had what the city called a snowmageddon. In fact, we had three. And they all made it to the list of the 10 biggest snowstorms in Baltimore history. In the biggest snowmageddon, the city was so unprepared that everyone was snowed in and couldn't get to work. So the city declared an emergency two-day holiday. So we got the day off from school. And in the morning, when we opened the door to look outside, the snow was up to my thighs. And as we were enjoying some fresh ice kacang over breakfast, we were wondering, what do we do with all this time and all this snow? We thought, why not make an igloo? So we YouTubed a protocol on how to make an igloo, located some brick molding containers, which happened to be my Toyogo drawers. We called in some like-minded friends, and we worked for two days, day and night, in the freezing cold. And eventually, we had something that resembled somewhat like an igloo. And you know, when I think about things that I've done, I would say these are one of the great things that I've done. And you might be wondering, how can something that only a few people know about, something that eventually melted and gives me no lasting recognition whatsoever, could ever be considered great? But if you think about it, we were just five graduate students. We had some time and we had some snow. But we set a goal and we put some effort. We worked in the freezing cold. And eventually we got what we set for. That experience told me that I can set a goal and I can put my effort and I can achieve something. It gave me great satisfaction. It was a similar satisfaction that I felt the year before in my final year of undergraduate study at UIA Kwantan. Then it was a new campus for the Kulia of Science. We were previously in the Gombak campus. But we put up quite a protest when we found out we were going to be sent somewhat in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> far away from KLCC, and pretty much left to our own devices in in a new and quiet campus. But I was part of a group that we called the WACOS Project. We had won the first prize for a Maxis Cyberlink competition for our proposal. Our proposal was to transform an empty room into a student resource center and to transform that new campus from a quiet one to one that was bustling with activity. And when I became the project manager, I thought, I want to do something that's exciting. And I want something people remember. So we set the goal. We said we would make an environmentally themed play. And we held auditions for all these science students, got some actors. We wrote a script. We prepared our props and costumes. 
we did some marketing, and eventually we performed to a full house. And we raised some money for an orphanage on the side and created some lasting memories. And the resource center is still there, still being used. It was a similar satisfaction I felt even earlier that year when I wrote a complaint to the Malay Mail uh, because the insurance company denied us uh, of my father's policy. You see, the modus operandi is of most insurance companies, I'm sure some of you might be aware, is to treat all claims as fraud unless proven otherwise. And couple that with some inefficient bureaucratic processes, and what we had was submitting report after report, document after document, and repeating the same statement to different people in different departments. And worse, we were made to feel like we were frauds, all the while trying to recover from the shock and the grief of losing our father. I knew my father wouldn't stand for that. So I set a goal. And my goal was they would stop harassing my mother and my father's intention to care for his family after he passed on would be honored. And I crafted the letter, it was published. The claims department got told off by the CEO. They apologized to my mother and our claim was approved. We could keep the house. I think my father would have been very pleased. I suppose that's an opportunity for me to talk about my father. Because if I had to think about some great people I know, and I may be biased, I think he was one of the greats. He was certainly holistic, definitely entrepreneurial, a very balanced and moderate man, articulate, and one of the most thoughtful, intelligent, and well-read people I know. He was a computer scientist, and he loved this work. I have very vivid memories of him lying on the floor on his tummy, immersed in his codes, and my sisters would take turns riding his back. And his, his friends also, I think, remember him in the same light. I was very fortunate a few years ago that I actually met one of his close friends, a man named Jonas. He is from Sweden. So when I met Jonas in Lund, which is where my father first met him in 1990, Jonas shared with me a story he sometimes told his students about his Malaysian friend. This is the story. We were once writing a vectorizing compiler in Lund in a computer design course with everything from compiler, simulator, to VLSI implementation. During that very intensive spring, Nafi created only one single bug but it took one week to find, because nobody thought it was in Nafi's code, for good reason. When Nafi realized it was in his code, he made a printout. He lit a cigarette and reread his code, very focused. After one hour, without going to a computer, he announced that he had found it. He corrected it in a minute or so, and then he made no more bugs. My father was a great computer scientist, a great computer programmer, and he had a good job at Mimos. But at some point, he realized he wanted to set a greater goal for himself. So he left a secure job at Mimos, and he established a new company called Axiomatic Solutions. The logo, the original logo, is three dolphins sleeping because they were his daughter's favorite animal. And the main product was the axiomatic multi-platform C to Java compiler. It's obsolete now. <laughs> but at the time, it was very exciting. But a new business is very difficult to start off. But my father always said, nothing is difficult 
only more complex. And with that, he persevered. And just as the business was about to take off, he has a myocardial infarction in his office. He was 45. So in that dark time, after first losing my father, of course, I asked why. Why is it somebody who had such great potential and was on the cusp of achieving great things, why did he have to go so soon? But I learned to let go of that question, and I moved on. But when I won Fame Lab, one of the things that I thought was very special that happened were a lot of the kind messages that people sent me. Some old friends came in touch. But among the most special messages were the ones that came from people who knew him. They said, we're very proud of Nafi's daughter. And that made me think back about my life from the point when he died until now. And I remember that question again. Why? Well, when my father died, I set a goal. I decided I wanted to go into research. And I set another goal, that I wanted to be trained in global disease epidemiology and control. And I also set the goal that I wanted to go to Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. So that led me to knock on the inbox of Professor Zairi Jiao at the Vector Control Unit. And that led me to a USM ASCS fellowship. And that eventually led me to a fully funded internship at the World Health Organization, working in the Global Burden of Disease Study in Viral Hepatitis, which then led me to a meeting in Australia on hepatitis, where I met my future supervisor, who also brought me into the world of tuberculosis biomarkers for my PhD. And that eventually led me to talking about tuberculosis biomarkers in a very badly made YouTube video that's there forever. <laughs> and when I realized there was another goal within reach, and this time there was a goal that I was carrying for a few more people than myself, I set that goal even stronger, that I would win one for Malaysia, for a Muslim woman, a Malaysian Muslim woman, and alhamdulillah, I did. And I think that's why I'm here today, to talk to you about how to be Hibat. But I also think it was an opportunity for me to share with you some of my memories about a very Hibat man that I know. So that's just me winning same lab. And I'm almost nearing the end of my talk. The timer's ticking very fast. But my embarrassing admission is I actually don't have a recipe on how to be great. I only hope you leave with three things. One is that greatness starts with a goal and an effort to achieve them. And there is a lot of satisfaction that you can get in just trying for your endeavors. The second thing is that great things can also be very small things, things don't, that don't seem very important to anyone else, but they can also later lead on to bigger things that have impact on those around you and maybe even further. Finally, greatness comes to players, not the pawns. Life can be tough. There will be adversities and challenges. And pawns can succumb to these situations, but players will rise up, and they can transform these challenges into opportunities. So we all have the capacity within us, as long as we're alive, to do great things. And they may be as fleeting as building an igloo with a few friends, they can be as momentous as winning an international competition or staging a play. They can be as simple as writing a letter to help 
your family. Some of these achievements, you can also be recognized by your peers and awarding bodies. You can put them on a resume, but some of them only you can appreciate. Do them anyway. So knowing that everyone and anyone have the capacity to be great, I hope you do set yourself some goals and try to achieve them. I hope you remember that greatness comes in all shapes and sizes. And I hope you remember to take charge of your life so that even if life hands you some lemons, you can endeavor to turn them and sell some lemonade. And even if life gives you a loss, you can get a gain. And if life ever gives you a snowmageddon, I hope you endeavor to build an igloo. It's really fun. Thank you.